is you're spending more time because your home is not set up to work for work, basically. Yeah, so somehow we've managed to set ourselves to and get along with the, the changes. The, of course, we have no choice. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Just a quick check, sort of, Eugene. Um, am I going to be able to share a couple of slides? Yes, you can. You can. How many slides? About four. <laughs> about four. Yeah, that that should be okay. I think. I okay. Think. Cool. 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 Hi, Jeremy. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear everybody. Yeah. Can you all hear me? <coughs> Not fine. Yeah. 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 Good. Hi, Michelle. Uh, I had issues with my laptop, so I'm using my iPad. I hope everything is working all right. Hi, Eugene, Michelle, can you can you that, uh, Eugene, can I check your settings that uh, you've allowed everyone to share their uh, slides? <coughs> settings. How do you do that? <laughs> your settings, make sure that, that people are allowed to share their slides. Okay, I've done it. Okay. okay. Oh, yes. Yes, you have. Yes. I think in the interest of time, let's, let's just start and then people can join us as we progress. Just That's because fine. we are ending to... I think we go all the speakers. Michelle, can you hear us? Sorry, I'm on mute. Oh, can you oh, hear me? Oh, are yes, you, yeah. you can hear. Okay. Yes, I can hear. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Denise, can you hear us? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Oh, you meant Denise. I don't apologize. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Denise or Denise. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let, let me just say, share my screen if you don't mind. Can you see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, it's, it's uh, two minutes past six. Probably let's just kick off and then people can join us as we, we progress. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, our webcast on uh, this Friday and taking your time to, to come and share your, your thought and perspective. Um, today, I'll be, I'll be your host. My name is Eugene Izaiman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of SSG Consulting, and also I'm the chair for One Africa Network and the executive chair for African Business Chamber based in Birmingham. And I'm supported by my colleague and the partner at SSG, Dennis Aguma, and also who's a chair for co-chair for One Africa Network and a visiting lecturer at the Birmingham City University. So before I start, I just want to give a bit of intro in terms of uh, what One Africa is all about. So One Africa is a membership-based think tank and social development organization we established two years ago that focuses on the issue that affect Black and African businesses, entrepreneurs and professionals in the UK, but we've expanded our scope, uh, including Africa. So our commitment is mainly looking at advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, excellence, inclusiveness, and sustainable economic growth. So we serve as an important uh, catalyst for brokering ideas, action, stimulate some uh, thought-provoking debate like this one, and we offer practical and creative solution to address some of the challenges. So over the last, uh, over the last two years, we've, uh, we've Sorry, my, my computer is a bit. We've hosted a series of uh, activity on a monthly basis, ranging from discussion or panel to networking events to seminars and various uh, platform. And we've uh, invited various thought leaders, speakers from all walk of life, from professor, academia, business leaders, government officials to to share their perspective and some their thoughts on, on how we can address and tackle some of the challenges faced by the, our members and the community. So these are some of the, some of the events we've hosted, mainly collaborating with the various organizations within the Birmingham 
but now we are expanding across the UK while working with various other organizations. So for today, focusing mainly looking at uh, the impact of C19 on the STEM sector, so mainly looking at some of the disruption as a result of the COVID-19, the risk and the opportunities as we emerge from the lockdown. So be before COVID-19, of course, the industry was was transforming and uh, we know in the uh, STEM industry cover quite a lot of sectors of economy ranging from uh, manufacturing to uh, finance to healthcare, engineering, energy, oil and gas, so many, so many sectors, almost every sector of economy kind of has some element of STEM. So, and we know it was already quite, there were a lot of shifting and some trends transforming the industries ranging from digitization, industry for AI, 3D printing, IoT, 5G, advanced manufacturing, engineering technology, automation, smart factories, and health, health tech, blockchain, finch tech, cyber security. So as we move to remote working and the digitized organization, and specifically for automotive sector, we've seen a huge change moving for, from um, IC, internal combustion engine to um, BEV battery electric vehicle to shared services to connected and, and auton autonomous vehicle to vehicle to connect to grid and various connectivity and also intelligent transport systems and uh, we've seen quite a lot of changes and in, in also in terms of what a vehicle is looking in terms of uh, the software the application like software on the AI, self-diagnostic and all those. But out of all those, of course, the industry we know is also struggling in terms of shortfall of skilled workers, businesses struggling to, to secure skilled laborers and majority are importing quite a lot of them, especially in the healthcare sector. And also because the UK also falling behind as a result of a Brexit in terms of industry for evolution. And also other key barriers ranging from uh, skill development, awareness of jobs and, and diversity. These are some of the things that has been transforming the sector. So in terms of some of the research has been going on, there were already predictions in terms of how technology, the STEM is moving in the future. These are some of the um, laws that are likely to come up in the computer, to mechanical engineering, to various aspects that will shape the industry. Now we had, for the last two, three months, COVID came in and the accelerated some of the transformation we were seeing and also disrupted the majority of the things from manufacturing we've seen, complete supply chain disrupted the huge cancellation in a major project and the, uh, activities, the restriction in movement, and lots of things have changed. And we are likely to see a lot of change in, in the coming months and years to come. And of course, at the, at the heart of it, digitization has helped uh, companies to work remotely, virtual service delivery and all those things. And, and in addition to that, we've seen healthcare also struggling to cope up with some of the um, challenges they are facing as a result of C19. So today the agenda is quite simple. We hope to, to the, the discussion will take around uh, 60 minutes and we probably will take 20 minutes. So we aim, we aim to finish around exactly 7.30. So we hope to keep on time. So we have a few questions in some of the, to understand what are the changes in the industry some of the disruption we are seeing and in the various sectors of economy and where the opportunities are. So hopefully by the end of the discussion, we will be able to inform our audience listening to us where, what are the challenges as we emerge from, from the lockdown, where the opportunities will be for professionals and businesses that are looking to create new opportunities or accelerate their operation. So to help us understand some of the changes and the shift in the in the industry, I'm delighted to welcome um, 
our speaker. And thank you for joining us. Today we have uh, Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan Thomas, uh, who's the chief economist at Asancha and also founder of um, Afri Afrinomica. Probably tell, tell us a bit more. And then we have uh, Dr. Oltunde, who is the program director on um, public health at uh, Birmingham City University, joined by Dr. Mm -hmm. Merlin, uh, who is the CEO for Prof. Eve and also director for Blair Project. And in addition, we have Michelle Chivunga, who is an expert in Finch, uh, Finch Tech and the blockchain and has been working on uh, quite a lot of uh, amazing activities. In addition to that, we have Dr. Mushaul Delemi from World Vision, Dr. Agustin from uh, Coventry University, Dr. Adelebi from uh, University of Aberdeen, and finally, Denise, who's the founder and the CEO of a recruitment agency called Evenfield Careers, also to help us in terms of some of the changes shifting and moving in terms of recruitment. So to kick off the discussion, probably, if I if I start with the Dr. Jonathan to to kind of kick off um, with uh, introducing himself and share his perspective in terms of how the industry he's working in, especially the financial and the consulting, has shifted and some of the changes he's seen and the, and share some of the perspective how you see the future look like in the coming months and years to come. Jonathan, welcome and please take the stage, introduce yourself and give us a bit of brief about who you are and also share some of the insight you, you hope to. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you. This is going to be in a good test of my ability to um, work with just my laptop because I have two screens on a work laptop, but I've just got my own laptop here and I'm trying to share the screen. Let me know if you can sort of see it. Is it up? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, just a few words about myself. I've got about a kind of 10 minutes. I'm gonna to try to pack everything in. I'm currently at Accenture where I head up um, the economic modeling kind of data science team in UK and Ireland and increasingly kind of Europe as well. Um, we're, a, we're essentially a think tank, Accenture, that sort of research within a all singing, all dancing business advisory corporation, Accenture, which employs, or perhaps employed, we'll soon see 500,000 sort of people in about 120 countries around the world, all told, most of them in India and the Philippines, because that's where most of our um, outsourcing and our back office, that kind of client ops kind of takes place. But most of the, dare I say it, um, at the kind of client facing activities takes place outside of those sort of jurisdictions. Uh, I've been at Accenture for three years now. Before that, I was working on the trading floor at Lloyd's kind of banking group, actually engaging in actual kind of real life kind of trading activities, mainly bonds with some economic and kind of trading strategy advice on top. And before that, I was at the Bank of England. And before that, I taught at Cambridge and sort of UCL economics. Sorry, Jonathan, to interrupt, we can see your screen, but we're not seeing the slides. Ah, so you can't see... We can page. see the, the page where it's downloaded is about to start automatically. But I think on the left is the One Africa Network uh, PowerPoint. Maybe that's the one you wanted to share. The one on the left. Well, all I can see is... Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. This is always... Right. I think you're, yeah, you're probably sharing the wrong screen, yeah. the wrong slide. Okay. Uh, bear with me a moment. I'm going to... Going to so do... You have two tabs open, and I think the first one is the, is the Zoom one, but the one before okay. that appears to have the One Africa Network. Okay. Uh, there we are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, okay. Let's get started. Okay, so there are three themes to, to what I think is important, both from an Accenture perspective and from an Africa stroke, Afronomica kind of perspective in terms of things that we're particularly interested in at the moment. In terms of 
the big kind of key business themes just before the pandemic um, kind of struck and went sort of global, there were about kind of six or seven that were really occupying most of our time and most of what kept kind of clients awake at night. And I'll try to link these back to COVID kind of 19 in a moment, but let's just kind of go through them. The first is kind of localization. There is no doubt that even before kind of C, kind of 19, there was a trend towards households wanting stuff that was a kind of local, locally made, locally sourced if possible, and especially when it came to um, kind of consumer sort of goods, kind of clothing and food and the sort of beverage kind of sectors. And we've seen that to some extent in the whole a, a kind of niche, kind of single kind of producer, a kind of sole trader kind of model that, that has kind of sprung up alongside some of the more kind of traditional the kind of purveyors of these items that we would have seen. The second is just a kind of concentration and that's the growth of kind of mega sort of cities. Most of our, most of our kind of global kind of clients, um, our larger ones, are particularly now kind of focused really on sort of urban populations, especially in developing sort of markets. And that's kind of relevant for Africa as well, where some of the fastest urban centers are sort of growing. And it's also kind of relevant in some of the countries and cities that we don't tend to think about very much, such as Yaoundé, Abidjan, Douala, Luanda. Uh, some of the smaller ones are where really where some of more a kind of global kind of corporates that have made an entry into those the kind of markets have seen kind of the bigger sort of growth in sort of revenues and sort of profitability. The third one is automation. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. That's quite obvious, but I'll roll back to that in a minute. The fourth one is kind of circularization or the circular economy, as we kind of call it. Increasingly, the whole kind of climate change, kind of resource, kind of maintenance, sustainability agenda and themes have pushed their way up onto what CEOs are thinking we need to find a way of showing the market there that we're one of these companies that, that takes the whole kind of sharing economy agenda kind of seriously and uh, if we're to be judged we're going to be judged in a favorable kind of light. The, the next one falls in two kind of directions as far as kind of the production of goods actually goes. Firms are increasingly opting for kind of simplification of a product Okay, the outer shell of a product and making it bespoke inside. That saves a lot of money and it means that they can also get the simplification and the customization attributes that they're kind of looking for in within a single kind of box. A great example is I would dare anyone to drive behind any Audi made within the two years, within the last kind of couple of years, and from behind be able to tell, well, apart from if it's an SUV, if, it, if it's a car, to be able to tell whether it's an um, Audi 1, Audi 3, Audi 4, etc. The shell is exactly the same. You have to look elsewhere within the product and it's built on the same kind of platform. It's what's inside that sort of matters. The, the next one is, and this goes against the kind of conventional kind of wisdom of what the whole kind of digital agenda and the kind of digital um, transformations are delivering us at least it did for me at the start was that many of the markets that have been increasingly kind of digitalized have also been monopolized there are several kind of reasons for that including the increasing importance of intangible investments um, rather than our traditional um, use of what a kind of capital actually means that are really are kind of driving that and what that means is that there are fewer firms supplying more and more of our goods the next one is kind of the servitization, which is basically most products that firms are trying to sell us now, the product is the hook within which they're going to sell us additional services on top of the product, which is really where they're going to make their money. And the final one is kind of virtualization, where it is basically, as far as firms are concerned, I don't need my skills where I am. I just need to be able to access them kind of virtually. And of course, we're experiencing that now. So what has kind of C19 kind of does as, as far as these kind of key business trends? Well, I've circled the one that as far as we're concerned 
it's uh, accelerated and we think that firms are going to be even more keen on whatever investments they make both in the short and the medium run these are these are the boxes that they're going to want to tick the most or the first on their agenda in terms of what that means for the sectors um, uh, for the sectors and the types of skills particularly with in terms of with a stem uh, lens over them that are really going to a kind of drive the demand for stem skills over the next kind of few years we think that the care economy and that's mainly kind of the healthcare, but not exclusively, is going to be a kind of the key one. We're approximating that about 40% of the jobs where a STEM slant is going to be absolutely kind of critical to that job is going to be in the care economy. And that's going to range from machine learning to decipher a kind of patterns in a much more if, if efficient and a faster way than the human eye can to actually kind of robots in the home uh, that's a space to watch kind of sales marketing and content has always been a driver that's not that's not going to change kind of data ai kind of cybers are given engineers are given the cloud has jumped up the agenda and the green economy is also one where we think that there's a we think firms are going to grasp the opportunity to actually tie their sustainability colors to the mast as it were, and to advertise them to be seen as doing something good. But there's also a business imperative there. Now, in terms of STEM occupations, there are two types of STEM skills that we're all going to need. The first are the baseline ones. And, the, and by the baseline ones, what we need are those skills that are already out there that, if you like, our competitors should have and we should have. But the real key skills that we're going to need, as in all endeavors are going to be the disruptive ones the ones that bring something new to the table and something that is viable and i've called them stem disruptive here but actually i could take the stem away just you're not going to need a stem kind of background in order to bring those disruptive skills to the kind of table and add a sort of value so as far as the fourth industrial kind of revolution goes um, where are the key kind of talent shortages as far as we're concerned. You can see some of them, um, the ones that we've kind of uh, recognised and that we kind of focus on on the slide. Very few of them are specifically STEM oriented, where a STEM focus or STEM skills are all you're going to need. All of them right, are going to involve us working with machines in order to deliver the task that we're going to need. For our, for our company. And I've said on the right, I can't quite, uh, I've, I've written a kind of T on the right, because what firms are increasingly kind of looking for is someone who can specialize in one or two of these kind of talent shortages, but can read across and make a contribution to the company in all of them. So firms, for example, and Accenture is one, I've got a team of about, 18 people in the UK and Ireland, about 30 once we add in kind of Europe. I've only got two of us are ones who I would say tick the mathematical reasoning, kind of programming, hypothesis testing, analysis, and evaluation box to a great deal of depth that no one else can go. Most of us can contribute to all of the kind of talent shortage kind of boxes that you see here. And that's going to be increasingly important. So it's not going to be STEM and a kind of nothing else. Um, those individuals aren't really that useful to Accenture and they're not gonna be kind of useful to most of the companies of the future. And just a final slide, which is, and this has kind of got a bit of an Africa, Africa kind of lens on it and where, where I think uh, we as a community, but Africa as a continent is gonna to have to, to kind of grapple with some of these issues going sort of forward. The first one is that the production, the idea that all Africa has to do, or all we have to do, is just a kind of stand still and kind of manufacturing production is going to shift because of kind of a low a kind of cost base or, or because uh, offshoring is still seen as something that's valuable for companies. That's going to slow and that's actually going to go into the kind of reverse in the next 
five years or so as far as we're concerned. It's already started to slow, and that includes investment from kind of China. So the idea that we're going to be able to upskill because capital is going to come from abroad and knowledge is going to come from abroad, we're going to stand still, and then we're going to be able to piggyback off that and develop our own productive kind of capacity, that's looking increasingly unlikely. Value chains are becoming almost completely kind of digital now and kind of seamless, right from R&D, right to the final kind of product, right through to the services that are going to be based on the back of those kind of products. The third one is that this idea that a kind of costs and a kind of low costs in Africa or in any a kind of country is going to be a killer when it comes to the decision that CEOs are going to make as to whether to invest or not. That's also gone. CEOs are increasingly concerned about, and that's coming to focus in the last kind of couple of months, what's the response time, what's the reliability of my supply chain. Ultimately, that's what's going to get me to take my product to market in good times and bad. The fourth one is that automation will be good for everybody as a whole, i.e. it will increase the size of the cake, but the distribution is going to differ. And the distribution at the moment, if we stand still, is going to move against those who are most kind of vulnerable to the type of skills or tasks that can be automated. And the, and the final one is that a kind of competition both between kind of countries and within kind of countries is going to shift towards innovation and customer sort of service. I'll stop there and um, I'll pass it to someone else. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for that insightful uh, introduction and, of course, overview in terms of how the industry is shifting. Probably, if anybody who has questions, if you, if you hold on or you can pause them and then we can go through them at the end of the, the presentation and the discussion. That we, um, if I now go to Dr. Altunde to also probably introduce himself and also give a, a bit overview in terms of how the healthcare sector has been shifting. I know they've been at the forefront in terms of responding to COVID crisis and the quite a lot of major issues has come out. If you, if you mind also take the stage and also give a bit of a brief in terms of how the industry is moving and where you see the challenges and opportunities that will be helpful. Can you ask Rotunde? He muted. If you could unmute him, please. Hi, Aremi. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Eugene. Well, my name is Olatunde Aremu. Um, my background is in pharmacy and uh, health economics. So I've more or less like uh, worked in a uh, pharma industry. I've worked with uh, you know, uh -huh. the, the, the big ones like uh, Pfizer, uh, Novartis, and uh, Eli Lilly before I moved into you know, uh, academia and I did a bit of a, a med tech consulting as well. So now, if I have to start from uh, what is happening now in my you know, field of practice, let us look at education, for example. So this COVID-19 has been more or less like you know, a game changer and it's going to affect several you know, universities worldwide in terms of service provision you know, to their students. For example, in the UK, we are noted for having a world-class you know, education, basically. So, uh, which is why you know, UK continue to be you know, uh, one of the you know, most uh, sorted after destinations for you know, people wanting to read, you know, maybe from Africa or Southeast you know, Asia. So if I have to take a cue, for example, for uh, about one of the courses that I, you know, uh, manage, uh, MBA in healthcare management is more or less like a, a, an e-learning sort of. So, which means we have you know, students across, you know, the world. You know, they are working and you know, they are, you know, following online you know, provision of the course as well. So now, this COVID-19 has caused, you know, a massive, you know, disruption. I'm going to give you an example of one of our MBA students. The, the student is working with a biotech company in India, and they are into manufacturing of hyaluronic acid. So for those of us that are you know, in the clinical setting, we do know that hyaluronic acid is one of the you know, uh, active you know, uh, uh, ingredients when it comes to treating patients with uh, age-related macular degeneration. 
and people that do have glycoma and several other things. So it has come up with a model that will make it easier for people in Southeast Asia and other low and middle income countries to be able to afford treatment for cataract, macular degeneration, and all the rest. So now with this thing that has just happened now, this student can no longer go ahead with the model that he has built. Now we have no pain, no people running the server in Sweden. The student is in India where the tutors were in Birmingham here. He's supposed to be in Sweden between March and September this year. So that is no longer going to be possible. So that is that for a particular student, a particular student's what scenario. So internally, if we look at it, we have students you know, from various universities that are training to be a nurse, you know, that are training to be you know, uh, uh, research scientists, which means they need to be working in the lab. So COVID-19 has now made that to be impossible. Of course, maybe people in engineering, they can do simulation to simulate some things, some scenario. But for those that are working in healthcare, is practically you know impossible so let's now leave you know that part of the uh, the situation aside let us look into you know the education now so students that are supposed to move from one part of the world to the other in order to be part of face-to-face -face, you know education and some other things they won't be able to do that of course e-learning is growing but still there's some you know tuition that cannot be given online and I know some colleagues here will attest to that. Maybe those in engineering and those, you know, maybe that are doing something else that has to do with, you know, showing people how things need to be done so that they can master it, so that they can know how to do it. So that, you know, is another thing that is going to, you know, that is happening now and that is going to affect the future because it means that most of these students, one, they won't be able to graduate at the, you know, at the right time. And some that maybe, they did more or less they, they managed to graduate what about you no know, the skills that they are going to lack so now if you now look at it from you no know, the public health you no know, point of view of course we have less cars on the road now which is good for the environment right but we can't say that it's going to continue like that because when we are talking about environmental pollution because of the issue at hand now some manufacturing companies they've ceased operation right so ceasing operation is going to be good for the environment. But at the same time, there's that issue of job loss there. So which, you know, our own government here is just trying to more or less like, you no know, to, to manage now. But for how long are we going to manage that? Well, it's good that, okay, some companies like Twitter, they said, okay, you are free to work from home forever. So not all industries or not, not all companies will be able to do that. So when we now look at that, and several other service provision as well. There are quite a lot of things that are going to be you know, affected. Let's now go to the global south now, or let's go to maybe you know, low and middle income countries now. Let us take, for example, Bangladesh and Nigeria. Bangladesh, in one hand, they have you know, companies that do manufacturers, you know, that, do, that do manufacture clothing. Some big retailers here in the UK, they have their manufacturing outfits in countries such as Bangladesh. Because of this COVID-19, that is no longer possible. And which is why, you know, some companies like maybe uh, you know, M&M Direct and several other ones, they ceased what? Selling clothes and they ceased what? Operation. So let us take, you know, a country like Nigeria, for example. Now, quite a lot of, you know, innovations going around now in Nigeria, in healthcare, and there are quite a lot of uh, innovations as well in fintech going you know, on now in Kenya, which at least to some extent, you know, we can call Kenya you know, champion when it comes to fintech in Africa. So now, this thing that has actually happened now has made some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to devalue their currency. So let us take Nigeria, for example. It means that Nigeria, a country like Nigeria, will now be more open to investors now because the local big players, because of devaluation of Naira, which is Nigerian currency, they won't be able Know, to come up with you know, very good financial muscle to more or less like support maybe um, a, a new startup or to support a particular you know, uh, uh, industry. So uh, the, 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 this current you know, uh, of COVID of 18 has actually you know, affect, is going to affect 
you know, I mean, in a long time, affect several areas of our lives, basically, from you know, training, you know, uh, uh, research scientists of the future, uh, from, you know, uh, uh, the impact it's going to have on our health. You no, know, of course, mental health. Without mental health, there's no health, basically. And that is you no know, happening currently now. Today, I just moved, in, you know, moved over, you know, I haven't sat on my seat for seven hours, you know, attending to student queries. I have around 16 students that I'm supervising, and it's just only two that I've spoken to today on something related to their academics. All other is about their social and emotional well-being. So basically, you know, someone you know, that is having you know, a mental health issue because of what, has, you know, what is happening now won't be able to be productive. And we're going to see quite a lot of that. Now we're having that in the NHS now. Nurses are burned out. Even before COVID, there are you know, issues or cases of burnout already. You know, doctors are burned out. You know, pharmacists and you know, several other you know, healthcare professionals as well. So now if you now look at it at a global scale, it's going to have effect on how we provide you know, healthcare you know, services to people. Because those companies that have shut their operations now, in pharmaceuticals, for example, 90% of pharmaceuticals being used in low and middle income countries are from China. 60% of pharmaceuticals you know, that are being used you know, in high income countries are mean you know, uh, ingredients that are being used in Europe. They are from India. So, and this COVID you know, uh, situation has made that to be what? Practically impossible. So if you look at it, maybe someone with you know, diabetes, for example, because if you look at it very well, around 65% of people that you know, have been affected by COVID, they are either diabetic or hypertensive. Of course, if they are diabetic, they are going to be hypertensive. So now, for example, someone that you know, needs insulin to survive, it's not that they won't be able to get it, but it means that that is going to be in short supply as well. You know both in the countries such as the UK and globally. So, and on another side, we have to continue to look at the brighter side because we can't be you know, looking at the bad story all the time. So the, 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 the good part of this thing is that it's going to make it much more easier for those governments you know, globally that have not taken you know, the health, you know, and healthcare provision for their you know, uh, citizens seriously. It's going to put them on their toes. And at the same time, it's going to open up you know, avenues for you know, uh, third sector organizations to be able to come to the aid of those you know, uh, uh, governments. In Africa, we, we know what is happening in Nigeria about you know, people in public sector you know, or private sectors you know, coming to help the country or the government. We know the same thing in South Africa, the same thing you know, in, uh, in Kenya, and at the same time in Tanzania. And of course, here as well, we can see how some organizations are manufacturing PP, you know, donating those to government and some other things. And even some small, small biotech companies that we never heard of before. Now they are in the race now, trying to look for how to get you no know, vaccines for you know uh, COVID-19. So in a way, it's going to drive innovations. So which is going to be good, you no, know, for economy and for you know people that are, are going to more or less like a change, you know. Uh, their feed of uh, 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 practice. But my own concern for you know, uh, the country, I mean, the United Kingdom now is that uh, now, technically, we are out of the EU. So basically, so which means we're going to miss out on a lot of things, a lot of disruptions. I mean, those that will require regulatory approval. And that is going to, now that is already ongoing and that is going to, you know, is going to continue. So I think uh, I will have to stop there. Thank you, thank you, Olatunde, for that brief uh, overview in terms of some of the changes uh, affecting the healthcare and the pharma industry. Uh, if I go to Merlin, Merlin. Oh, oh, so, sorry, sorry. I have one thing that I need to chip in. So now there's now increase in the rate of food fraud as a result of COVID, and it's a global phenomenon. <laughs> Uh, is, is so, which is point? which is something we all need to worry about. It's a good point because already there is a concern in terms of disruption in the food supply chain, which is yes. a lot of uh, food security concern across. That's the right. That's and right. In terms of economies are restricting import and the export as we move forward. Yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. point. Thank you for noting that. 
Uh, if I go to Merlin, Merlin, I know also you are involved in quite a lot of uh, activities that touches many STEM uh, sectors. If you also can introduce yourself and uh, give a brief in terms of some of the changes you've seen and disruptions from your side, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, good evening, everybody. I'll probably start with just explaining a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm actually a chemistry graduate uh, uh, of Birmingham University. Uh, and after I graduated, I, uh, I did a postgraduate in radio and TV journalism, worked for the BBC for about 17 years, and then uh, reinvented myself as a leadership coach and international trade specialist. And with some funding from the Foreign Office, uh, went to Kenya, uh, mobilising uh, the Chevening alumni network, uh, and Chevening, if people are not aware of, uh, it's a fund that the Foreign Office has been running for years. They identify high potential individuals and they pay for them to come and do a master's and they go back to their own countries. And invariably, they do very well. And some of them have become presidents of countries or presidents of uh, large corporations. So a very influential network. Uh, so I was out there for about three years, um, uh, facilitating trade deals between UK companies, Kenya companies, and it worked very well indeed. Uh, and then there was a change of government. Um, and uh, I thought, right, I'll make Kenya my base. I really love Kenya, East Africa as well, Rwanda um, in particular. And... Uh, and then it, there was a, a terrorist bomb at the Westgate Shopping Centre, which brought me back here because my business was based there. And, uh, and then reinvented myself in terms of motorsport. So I think that's been the, the text of my life is, is about reinvention. And I think really going forward, COVID is going to require all of us to reinvent ourselves and to change our perceptions about what it is that we think we can or can't do. Um, in the past, there was something called a job for life. I think that that's pretty mm. much gone mm. in a lot of areas. And obviously people working in sectors that they will lose their jobs, uh, whether it's retail, more retail going online, less mm. to do with shops, um, could be airline pilots. There will be uh, a need for people to be willing to embrace the fact that they will need to change and adapt and that actually it's a good thing. I think people are fearful of change but I think in terms of dealing with mental health we need to build people's resilience and actually show them that within every threat especially something like COVID there is the there is an opportunity waiting there for uh, those people who are creative. So that the whole thing with automation, and I'll talk about my involvement in Industry 4, but the one thing that robots can't do is create. It's a very unique ability of human beings. So I think even more so than before, being a creative individual, being able to come up with new ideas, products, even chart the way forward. So we've been approached by um, local authority and government about coming up with new ideas for the post-COVID recovery. One of those that I've, I'm developing uh, with partners, uh, which include uh, Manchester University and Manchester Science Partnership, is creating a new um, training centre called the Manchester Innovation Activities Hub, which will reskill and upskill residents who've lost their jobs, um, who are working in different sectors, because we have uh, a booming uh, digital engineering manufacturing sectors in Manchester. Health and innovation is the other uh, big area, but we don't have enough technical people with the technical skills to fill those positions. So they're currently empty. And Manchester, the interesting thing about Manchester Science Partnership and where it's located, it is driving about a third of the growth in Manchester, but it neighbours Moss Side, the most deprived area in the whole of Greater Manchester. So 
much more needs to be done to ensure that those residents can actually begin to access some of the opportunities that are now available within Manchester's booming economy. And that's part of what we're looking to do. We have so many unemployed graduates, uh, it's a, a, a crying shame. And so part of that work will be about uh, upskilling those graduates again, so that they can go and work for some of the large employers, whether it's Arup or Siemens or Heineken is on the doorstep in the food and drink manufacturing sector are embracing automation, industry 4.0 technologies, which include robotics, AI, machine learning, that kind of thing. Um, if anybody had told me when I was um, even doing my chemistry degree that I would now be heavily involved in motorsport, I would have told you that you'd lost your mind. But I think it's, so uh, I'll tell you, so after I came back from Kenya, my middle son, who was only 18 at the time, had been traveling the world, and he came back, decided he didn't want to go to university, even though he'd done really well with his A-levels, but he wanted to, to set up a business uh, to help his younger brother, Blair, achieve his dream of uh, racing in, uh, at the highest levels of uh, motorsport. Uh, it was costing us as a family about 35,000 a year for him to race carts. But at the next level up, you're looking at 160,000. And then to break into Formula One, you're, you're looking at about 2 million. So I'm sure you will agree that's beyond the pockets of uh, most families. So Nal decided that uh, he wanted to do something about it. We set up the Blair Project. Mm -hmm. And it was very much about how can we tackle that issue, but be using new technologies. We knew we couldn't change the world of motorsport, which currently existed because people are very stuck in their ways. But we decided, why don't we embrace new technologies like 3D printing, computer aided design, and teach young people how to adapt um, uh, secondhand carts and turn them into, um, uh, exciting racing machines. So he developed uh, something called Proto GP, which was about 3D printing of um, components on a cart, which young people got to test and race. Prince Harry came to our first test day, which gave us international exposure. And as a result, we were contacted by an American university uh, based in Indianapolis saying, can we partner with you? So now we're developing, or we have developed electric go-karts. So we run a, a, a STEM challenge program, um, which is about attracting people who have a low awareness of STEM careers because either they think that they're not bright enough to do it. But what we do is we teach them how to retrofit use petrol go-karts and turn them into fully electric uh, e-carts, which they get to test and race. We were funded by Manchester Metropolitan University to pilot Proto EV, which was a great success, especially, uh, as I say, with those young people who are in the middle. They're not the top achievers, but they're in the middle. And actually it enables them to discover talents that they never realized they had or, or, or passion such as 3D printing, computer aided design. Through our partnership with Manchester Metropolitan University, we signed up to their fuel cell innovation center, which specializes in hydrogen fuel cell technologies. And the thing about these hydrogen fuel cells, they extend the battery life for the batteries. So at the moment, there isn't an electric car racing series because the batteries don't last long enough integrating a hydrogen fuel cell within the, the system, um, uh, within the uh, propulsion system, uh, means that you can seriously extend the, uh, the battery range as well as recharging the batteries. We brought that down from eight hours to three minutes. Um, going forward, uh, we're looking to uh, bid for, we, we've partnered with a couple of companies in Nigeria, Malawi, um, and we are now bidding for some government funding to um, integrate hydrogen fuel cells with solar power panels. So in a lot of um, small um, uh, African villages and small towns, they might be off grid. Uh, hydrogen fuel cell technologies enable you to store the energy from 
a solar panel and store it and use it for when you need it. At the moment, if you don't use it, when it's generated, you lose it. So this is a way of ensuring that many more homes and businesses in Africa and here can go off grid. And in fact, the technology that we're now developing with researchers at the Manchester Fuel Cell Innovation Centre will enable um, the, you to plug out your um, hydrogen fuel cell from your solar panel. It's charged up, it's storing all this electricity plug it into an electric vehicle and you can drive around all day, but the electric vehicle will also keep the fuel cell charged up. And then you can plug it back into the house. And if you've got surplus, you sell it to the grid so you can earn money out of it. So that's something that we're doing as part of uh, the next step. Um, and then also we've just recently been commissioned to run a trade summit, an Africa trade summit. Um, which was going to focus on renewable energy, new technologies. It was due to be held uh, in Manchester in October as part of the 75th anniversary celebrations of the fourth Pan-African uh, Summit, which three individuals went on to be, become the uh, presidents of Ghana, Kenya and Malawi attended. So I'm talking about uh, Hastings Banda, uh, Joma Kenyatta, uh, and also uh, Kwame uh, and Kruma. Uh, so, um, uh, so that's now been rescheduled for um, March next year. Um, so it will be a, a, a physical event and we're hoping that the crisis will have passed. But what we're doing is also planning for the fact that we may have to incorporate um, virtual conferencing and explore new ways of engaging with people both here in the UK but also uh, on the African continent. So a number of heads of state will be attending but we were really keen to uh, connect the young uh, tech entrepreneurs in Africa with their counterparts in the diaspora here to see if how they can hack you know, we were going to run a, a day long hackathon to look at creating solutions to deal with societal challenges both here For the and also in, in the African if continent. If I just interject a bit, you are running out of time. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> are you finished? Yes. Sir. Ah, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And it's good you mentioned a few things. Of course, the current crisis called for for people to be a bit more agile and the resilience to to help them navigate the current some of the current um, challenges we are seeing and and of course your experience uh, as you've been reinventing yourself to to go through some of the key things you've experienced in your life is a, is a is a good lesson learned maybe, maybe a few people can take away and they help them and also it's good you mentioned about adapting and accepting the to the change will be a key moving forward to majority of people being disrupted. Uh, thank you for that, that summary and also sharing your experience and some of the amazing things you're doing. And hopefully probably we'll get an opportunity to hear more about. So if I go to Michelle, Michelle, if you can hear me and, and know, if you can introduce yourself and also give a bit of uh, overview in terms of some of the things you've been working on on the blockchain and the in the fish tank uh, sector and some of the shifts are likely to come. We know banking is also at the, at the, in, in, in the transit and we've seen quite a lot of changes and blockchain and AI is likely to be a major key driver moving forward. Um, yeah. Just give a bit of an, on, on that aspect. Sure. Thank you so much, Eugene. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to be to join you here. Um, a, a very quickly, you know, uh, background to myself. Uh, I used to be in, I started my career off actually, um, you know, at the University of Surrey. I studied at the University of Surrey and I did international business here. I am still live in Surrey actually in Guildford. Uh, and then I went on to do some work in uh, with government policy for a number of years when I graduated. 
uh, F, F, I, that, that was more economic and housing development policy. Um, and then after that, I went into finance and into you know, banking and finance. And I spent a couple of years uh, in corporate finance in the city in London. Uh, but the, my coverage there was very much uh, quite international. So I used to look at, you know, uh, finance packages for, uh, you know, international businesses all across the world uh, and working with the European Commission and other institutions more widely to design financing frameworks. Uh, you know, post kind of moving from the banking phase, I, I you know, decided, I was always a little bit of a disruptor. So I decided to set up my own thing, my own consultancy, uh, you know, mainly focused around, uh, I started looking at cryptocurrency actually around 2009. So very early on uh, when, you know, the first paper came out around uh, uh, cryptocurrency. So I've always kind of been very curious around the more digital front. Um, so I spent quite a few years, you know, kind of exploring and researching uh, early in those days, obviously around more crypto, uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, and I spent some time as well at the university, back at the university when I, when I finished uh, and came back here to work within the Center of Digital Economy within Surrey to look at uh, uh, emerging technologies. Uh, and and I've, ever since I've kind of been looking at it uh, within my own uh, consulting firm as well at the moment. Um, so in terms of blockchain and, uh, you know, emerging tech, I think, you know, this is pretty much the future, really. Um, and I think COVID has pretty much kind of set us off. Uh, whereas in the past, way before COVID, as much as we were discussing the opportunities with blockchain and really trying to highlight, uh, you know, what blockchain had to offer and other technologies, I don't think there was that much of a prominence or an understanding of what this technology could offer actually do or what they meant. Uh, whereas with this pandemic, I think it's almost kind of like presented us with a very global uh, problem that I think the technologies can actually now start to address. Uh, and, and it's pretty significant. I mean, blockchain is, is pretty, you know, uh, you know, people think of it as a very complex technology. It is slightly complex, but, you know, when you think about it, it is actually just a tool, a digital tool, you know, that helps to evaluate and uh, record data storage of value uh, and how that value is exchanged and transferred between different parties. Uh, you know, it's a very decentralized way of, uh, of, of doing things or exchanging value. Um, and I think because of the, uh, you know, transparency factors that come with things like blockchain and the opportunity to, you know, to work without necessarily having middlemen or, you know, third parties involved within transactions uh, presents it a very, very useful uh, in areas like, for example, supply chain management. I mean, we've seen what, you know, COVID has done in terms of supply chain, uh, you know, or just the, the, the catastrophe that has uh, happened because obviously, uh, you know, COVID has really halted the world uh, and has caused a lot of commotion even around sort of supply chain. Uh, you know, take for example, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Olatunde really pointed this out quite strongly in terms of obviously the movement mm -hmm. of services has been heavily impacted because of uh, even within across the trade, uh, the trade supply chain has been very, very difficult to, to see the transparency. Uh, you know, for example, medical equipment, medical kit, where do you get your kit? You know, how much of the kit is still available? Uh, you know, who, who, how much, how is it affordable? How are suppliers operating with each other? How is government managing in sourcing the equipment that they need? Have they got the right numbers? It's very, very difficult. I think it has been, ex you know, extremely difficult for all countries, regardless of whether you're developing or not non-developing, uh, you know, this has really shed some light uh, to say that whether you're developed or undeveloped, you know, the COVID has had a massive impact uh, globally. And I think, you know, for us in the tech side, it's, it's really presented as an opportunity to try and bring to the table some real, real solutions that can help in mitigating uh, against some of the solutions, some of the problems, especially around, like I said, supply chain. But also the very simple, basic things that I think we all take for granted. Uh, you know, we've all been so used to having that human touch. We've all been very used to interacting with each other on a kind of face-to-face. -face. Whereas now overnight, we've had to switch and work into virtual modes. I mean, you have to understand that's a transition for people. And with that transition, I think you're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, mental challenges back to the mental health issues because not everybody's familiar with working with digital. Not everybody knows how to operate Zoom. You know, and it's going to take some time. And, and obviously, even in large institutions that I have, you know, had engagement with, uh, who've kind of, kind of reached out to me and said, oh, Michelle, that stuff you're talking about two years ago. How do we now implement it tomorrow? You know, how do we now bring out those digital transformation strategies and, and put them to use and make them work? Uh, tomorrow, how do we encourage home working when we haven't set up for home working for our staff? You know, so these are real issues, I think, that a lot of organizations and, and countries are grappling with. Now, in the context of looking at Africa, you know, um, you know, there's a there's a kind of misconception around Africa, 
uh, you know, especially that we need to kind of always kind of be giving to Africa. We need to give, we need to give. No, I think Africa has massive opportunities here. You know, even with the COVID crisis, of course, we haven't been as heavily impacted in Africa in terms of the numbers, but there are massive opportunities in the sense of even technology, for example. So I have seen probably the best talent in terms of tech talent in hubs in, in, in Nigeria, in hubs in Kenya, in hubs in, <laughs> in Zambia, but they're very, very under-resourced, you know. They don't have the resources, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the skills to help them to kind of uh, grow their businesses from early stage startups to scale ups. So we need to start to think about how do we realign a little bit in terms of supporting, obviously, sort of entrepreneurs and startups and how we engage them. Because I truly believe that, you know, I mean, the future is very much going to be digital, but the future is also about talent. And that's what I really like about this webinar. If we can invest in the talent and start to actually realign and start thinking about that green economy, that sharing economy, then we're, to, we're heading towards that sustainability that we always talk about. So there has been over the years, it's not the first time we've talked about things like sustainability and the green economy and green financing. Now it's actually uh, COVID has mm -hmm. like the reason why we need to, to be like that, why we need to start encouraging more and more uh, a sharing economy. Now, some of the challenges, uh, you know, going back to the, to the tech, I mean, the tech is solutions, the tech are tools, but the human element cannot be eliminate, eliminated from that. You know, uh, as Marilyn said, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the creativity that comes with the human uh, element is pretty powerful and it's something that's going to be very difficult to replicate. So as much as automation is here to stay and we have to recognize that it's here to stay, we have to reskill up, uh, especially our young people and our older generations, people are shifting, you know, we have to be able to adapt to change. Um, you know, the, the, the current normal is, is no longer going to be normal and that's okay. You know, and it would take us a little bit of time to adjust to the new norm. Uh, but we do have to rescale up. We have to understand also how these technologies or these tools that we have to hand can help us. Uh, so one of the things I have recognized, certainly, you know, all across the world, you know, and I've been doing a lot of work around blockchain, you know, in different markets, especially in emerging markets. And one clear th common thing across the, whether it's, uh, you know, developed or non-developed, one thing that's missing is the lack of understanding. Uh, of truly understanding what is blockchain. Is it actually relevant for me? Should I even be paying attention to it? Uh, or is that something I should put aside and maybe I should be looking at things like, you know, AI, uh, or should I be looking at all of them collectively? AI, IoT, you know, technology, how do you, there's a lack of understanding in general at all levels. And I think for us, one of the biggest things we've been doing as a company is to look to educate, uh, uh, to really sort of make people understand how do you use away from the buzz and the noise and the sexiness that goes on. Uh, in the media and all that, we are looking to educate and to scale up in the areas where we feel that this technology can actually have a massive impact. Uh, and one of those areas I strongly feel, I've always called for this, I think is more around things like obviously supply chain management, around trade, you know, um, you know, trade documentation and, and real practical things like that. I mean, the, the zillions of trade paperwork that you have to fill in to get a good from A to B. Uh, you know, when you can actually use digitized methods to do that very, very fast and very efficiently and very transparently. So why are we not tapping on that? Why are we not leveraging that? Partly because people are not aware of the, the technologies that they can pull in and they can use. So there's a big education element. And I think up until we start to educate, uh, it will be very, very difficult to move from uh, A to, you know, to adoption. Uh, and the advantages we've had in the tech space for us, I mean, since COVID hit, to be honest with you, I've had a sleepless nights, which is a very, I'm thankful to God, it's a very good thing uh, because it's kept us very, very busy, um, you know, and, but more, a lot of people have lost jobs, a lot of people are struggling. Uh, and one of the things we are actually trying to do now is to onboard those people who might not have been involved in tech and have not been involved in, in, in blockchain. I've introduced an internship program with, with interns from all parts of the world you know, from Africa, from Asia, from Taiwan to Nigeria to Kenya, where I've said, you know, you're interested in blockchain, you want to learn about blockchain, you want to learn about uh, digital skills, come on and, and, and let's learn together and, and let's start to build together. So things, little things like that, I think will make a huge difference. Uh, you know, investing in the talent, understanding the, the tools that we have. And then for, for, you know, sort of on the policy level for governments and, uh, you know, international organizations, uh, one of the things I have been disappointed about is, is the lack of collaboration you know, across different nations and then coming together and saying, you know what, this is a global problem. Let's put away the, you know, us trying to be, you know, protectionist around things, uh, around just our nations. So we're just going to keep our stuff to ourselves. It's a global problem that is not discriminating against anybody. So we have to find some global solutions together. 
And I think that's what I'm, a message I'm really calling for. Of course, there has been some collaborations in certain parts, but I think that has to be amplified a little bit more in terms of you know, national governments really put an emphasis on working together to find solutions. The tech solutions are there. We need policies and uh, regulations that help us to bring the tech to the table with not necessarily you know, stopping us from doing what we do best. Uh, you know, of course, when it comes to things like crypto and all that, there are question marks around, uh, should we be regulating that side of things? What are we regulating? But if you're going to introduce regulation, do you understand the space you're regulating in the first place? Are you working with the pl players in that space to introduce the regulation? So there's a whole range of um, things I think, I think we need to look at. But uh, ultimately, for me, personally, one of my passions is really very much to invest in, in young talent, to invest even in older talent who want to shift who want to realign, who want to understand blockchain. You know, it is not just for young people. It's not just for, you know, people who are interested. It's for everybody. We want to understand you're interested. You want to reskill up. And now is the opportunity. Uh, am amongst the, 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 the horror that we're going through with COVID, there's massive opportunity. And I think the economies that are going to do well post this are the ones that are going to be digitally savvy, the ones that are going to embrace understanding and learning from other, you know, uh, uh, countries and are ready to work together collaboratively and start thinking about that sustainable green economy. That's uh, pretty much my thoughts. Thank you, Michelle, for that insightful um, perspective, especially quite a, lot of, quite a lot of changes likely to come and blockchain will play a key role in terms of moving forward. And, and it's, good to men it's good you mentioned about boosting the, the talent for the future. And I hope Denise will give some insights and in, in perspective how some of the best practice people can take away to to help some of the young people build some uh, skills that will make them <coughs> competitive. Before I go to Dr. Christine and uh, Delemi, if I go to uh, Dejara to just give, because I, pro I understand he want to go in a few minutes. If you give a bit of an um, overview in terms of some of the changes you've seen in the civil en engineering, I know that there were not much disruption like uh, many other sectors but if you give your you share your perspective also in terms of some of the changes you've seen and then we can go to the other speakers in. all right um so uh, thank you jane um yeah my name is um isra um uh, chauffeur so eugene i didn't get the industry you spoke about some of the changes i've seen in if you just give a, a bit of an overview in terms of, I know you are you you are heavily involved in the civil engineering. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's good. Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. So, um, I will give a very brief introduction of myself, and then just speak from there. So, I am a senior lecturer at University of Aberdeen in uh, civil structural engineering. Um, I have a bit of background uh, in the industry as well. So, I used to work in Hong Kong where I manage um, airport construction project. And I did, I was working in the office on consulting, structural engineering consulting as well. Worked in a university in England before I moved up uh, to Scotland. Yeah, and um, I've been in Aberdeen for the past five years. So um, changes in civil engineering. So I will talk about engineering in general, and um, I will talk about education. Uh, you, yeah, that's, that's what I do now. Um, now, it's interesting, so if you've been listening to the news over the past few weeks um, during this pandemic, there's a lot of things about STEM, actually. There's a lot of things about um, uh, ventilators, a lot of things about face masks, a lot of statistics, a lot of, um, you know, scientists coming to say one thing or the other. That's interesting, and there's a lot of things. In fact, there's something about apps, people developing apps and um, that's great so one of the things about STEM for me is uh, the publicity out there which is happening now so and it's happening uh, just, just because the pandemic is making it happen but the interesting thing is um, engineering as a whole is providing solutions and for the pandemic but engineering education is probably one of is going to probably going to be one of the most affected education because of this pandemic. And like um, um, uh, Tunde said, he mentioned something about uh, um, healthcare and all those things. But now, 
that engineering might not feel that. But engineering is traditionally, the way we teach engineering, and I say tra traditionally, is by showing a lot of practical examples. You have laboratories, you have, um, I mean, you must have lab components of uh, a lot of courses when you study engineering. So you must have read on the news. Um, a lot of Scottish universities now are looking at blended learning for next session. How would that work? How would you, if you don't have access to the labs, to the students, how are we gonna, uh, with a practical bit of engineering, how is it gonna, how is it gonna happen? How is that going to impact the future? How is it going to impact the kind of graduate that we produce? Because the future of STEM industry is the, is, is, is the workforce, basically. We're talking about innovation. We're talking about all these things. But that will not happen if you don't have proper workforce that are being you know, trained properly and they're growing into that. Innovation is not going to happen just like that. Of course, you can do the numerical simulation, but it's got its limits. And that, that's, that's one, one side of it. And if I, if I look at the other side of it, let's look at Africa. So now this is the time that we realize that we don't have our own solution. So there is lockdown, people study from home. Um, at least we have some platforms here, we can teach people and people we're beginning to look at, okay, how can we actually, how can students still learn even if they cannot come to the labs? But let's take Nigeria for example. During the lockdown, how I wonder how are students being taught? What platform are they using? Do we have local solutions to educational platform that students can actually use and be taught from? Local solutions. We have a lot of tech companies in Nigeria. We have a lot of tech uh, entrepreneur companies that are producing a lot of apps. But are we producing apps for ourselves? Are we, are we looking at the education industry? Because it's a huge industry, sir. That's one thing, but there is another thing. So there is another thing I want to talk about quickly before I stop. So let's look at the indirect impact of the pandemic. The indirect impact of the pandemic is what will happen. Um, we've been, we, you must have heard on the news, there is, um, we, it's like it's sure we have a recession coming. And when you have recession, yeah, great. Um, Education, don't, uh, university education don't really get affected by recession. It's been proven that during the recession, people tend to want to improve themselves and study. But the problem is, so they, you, they improve them and they study, but to what job are they going to go into? Because when there is recession, construction industry will be badly affected. Now I'm, I'm just uh, narrowing down to civil engineering. So I think, so that, those are the effects, but there, there, is, there are opportunities of rethinking things, automation and construction and a lot of things. There are opportunities of people, of us rethinking things. And that's difficult in academia because we do things the same way in a lot of ways, but this is an opportunity to rethink. Yes, they need to learn practical things, but do they have to go to the lab? That's very difficult. I'm just throwing it out there. Do they have to go to the lab? How can they still learn the practical stuff? So um, I think I will stop there, just so I can, I can keep going, but I know our time is fast. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Israel, for that brief introdu introduction and also touching some area and challenges in terms of the education. And the... before I go to Denise to give us a bit of an overview in terms of how we can develop the the talent i'm sure everyone has highlighted the, the issue in terms of maybe i can just briefly uh, invite augustine and the mushauri also to give a bit overview in terms of some of the changes they've seen in the energy sector and also uh, world vision i know they help they are involved in quite a lot of the healthcare probably touch a bit on that that would be helpful. Augustine, if you probably maybe start and then Shaul and then probably Denise will give us an overview as you cover quite a lot area of recruitment and talent development. That would be helpful. It's um, Augustine um, Ifelebuegu. Um, I'm an associate professor in um, energy and environment at Coventry University. And um, I just want to um, share a bit of my perspective in terms of some of the disruptions that we have seen 
obviously, um, um, I can look at it from various um, aspects. Um, um, and first of all, let me talk about the disruption in terms of um, the, the, the way that we now have to teach. Um, that has been seriously disrupted. And um, last semester, for example, in the uni, um, we had to um, teach online and we have to develop means of um, trying to still achieve our learning outcome um, online. So again, um, and that um, also is not just going to be this semester, even if the, you know, um, we go back to work um, in June or July, um, the next semester um, is still going to be online. So I think uh, going forward now, um, recently Cambridge announced that uh, there'll be no face-to-face -face teaching until summer of 2021. Um, so a lot of things are going to change. Um, a lot of disruption we're going to see in terms of um, learning and um, teaching and learning. Um, and like the gentleman just said, um, particularly for STEM, engineering science, where sometimes we have to do labs. Um, now we are thinking about alternative means of um, achieving some of these things. Um, for example, um, we do a field trip um, for our energy students um, to Norway. Um, and now we are thinking of creating a virtual field trip. Um, so this creates a great opportunity for virtual world creators where we can uh, try and see as much as possible, um, try and um, use um, um, some virtual realities to try and demonstrate certain practical aspects um, that we'll have to do in the lab. So these are a lot of changes that are happening and it actually creates an opportunity um, for um, virtual world creators. And that's one aspect. Another aspect is one that particularly affects the industry. Um, um, we, we are in the oil and gas industry. Uh, we, we, we teach students to um, join the oil and gas industry, petroleum engineers and gas engineers and oil and gas managers. Uh, these are tough times for the industry. Uh, just a few weeks ago, for the first time, we were seeing oil being sold at minus $38 uh, dollars per barrel. Uh, that it's a great disruption. Um, luckily for the contract that just ended, um, it didn't fall that much. But um, anything sub $40 a barrel, um, it's a very difficult time for the oil and gas industry. And as some of you already know, um, the US, for example, a lot of the shale production um, are, are shutting down because it's no longer economical. So it's a time for the industry, um, particularly the oil and gas industry now, to begin to look um, inwards. I think the um, era of the $100, $80 a barrel oil, um, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So we need to learn and go back and optimize our processes so we can drive down um, our production costs, um, our operating costs, um, by looking at some of the key cost drivers um, so that we can remain competitive. Otherwise, you're going to see quite a lot of bankruptcies happening within that industry. And of course, what that means is that a lot of people will be out of jobs. So there's quite that big risk um, that it's there. There is that disruption for that particular industry. Uh, but again, the industry over the years has been very, um, very, very resilient. And I'm sure that especially the U.S. shale producers will find means of trying to optimize costs and drive down the operating costs to remain at least um, afloat at a sub $40 uh, uh, price for um, oil price uh, for oil, which we think it's going to uh, be around for a while. Um, I, I don't, I don't think um, it's going to go away for the next two years uh, because of the impact that this is going, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, it's having. So that's one aspect in terms of how it affects the industry, how it affects the people. And for those of us in the academia, uh, we are looking at alternative ways of trying to achieve learning objectives. It's not going to be easy though for the very practical engineering aspect which you need to do in the labs. Um, so again, we need, we're, we're changing the way we work um, and these are some of the key disruptions. Um, I think I can stop here to allow the other gentleman um, to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Augustin, for that brief and uh, overview in terms of some of the changes, especially we've seen huge disruption in the oil price and the volatility which has affected many economies, including Nigeria and the Saudi Arabia now are already threatened with their budgeting. So it, and it's likely to create a huge disruption in the whole market. Uh, if I go to Mushauli also to briefly 
also introduce himself and also give a bit of a brief about some of the shift and the changes you've seen in the last few months and how where the opportunities are. That would be helpful. Uh, we can't hear you. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, with, hear without the the headphones. Yes, we can hear better without the headphones. Yeah, I think that's easier. All right, so my name's um, Shauri Delem, and I'll ask you, Eugene, if it's possible to share uh, a few slides at some point during my during my presentation. So I have a fairly different background from a lot more of you. I am a, a doctor, um, medicine doctor, uh, studied in Tanzania, and uh, I consider myself to be a public health as well as development specialist. My journey is fairly diverse. I have worked uh, within the hospital clinical care setting and also extensively within the public health, international public health um, sector. And um, this has been across uh, um, Africa, mainly Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, um, Asia, where I worked in uh, Bangladesh, um, a little bit Nepal, and um, obviously here in the in the UK. Um, currently, um, with World Vision, um, working as a, a portfolio manager, and I have a portfolio of countries in Asia, uh, supporting broad uh, uh, development programs. Uh, specific for for this talk, and uh, as it relates to to STEM. Um, what I focused my, my specific uh, uh, chart is on the potential for skill building uh, using, using STEM overall. And uh, I drilled this down to a, a specific, like I would say, case study, something of interest to, to myself, which is, is, a, is a flight training. Um, I have a personal interest, although I'm, 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 I'm on a doctor, I wanted to become a pilot when I was younger, and this led me into a new discovery space around uh, uh, flight simulation as as a means of uh, uh, recreation. But this, through self uh, teaching myself and uh, and and research, I've realized how potentially this can be also a tool to to impact. Um, a lot of people in terms of uh, skills building and, and also um, interest generation. So it goes similar to what Merrily was uh, was describing initially. So I have a few slides, and uh, I'll just um, uh, give you a, just a little overview onto onto this. It's open for sharing. You can click. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm good now. And, and if you can, if you can be able to be brief, mm -hmm. that also, it's it's then. just uh, probably five slides, which are fairly fairly quick, I'm sure. Yeah. So so this is literally use of flight simulation as a as a STEM tool, and uh, many people in the world they use flight simulation. It can be used from household level as a hobbyist. Um, like myself, to very advanced level in airline training uh, for pilots and things like this. Some of you are more into engineering field, you may know. Um, and uh, they vary from the things that you see now on the screen um, to, to, to complex. So in some cases, you have these very certified simulators, and if they are of that nature, people interacting with them can actually legally log hours because as you know in that sector people have to to be endorsed to 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 comply with the skill transfer and and technical know-how there are there are various different types of these machines these ones are the one that you see now is a, it's a bit of an advanced type and uh in terms of trajectory in the sector and if this can be true for many other sectors we know there are definitely skills gap 
um, across across the globe, but because this is a particular case study, we know there are there are predicted shortages of people within, say, air traffic control. Um, there was that trajectory growth in uh, in actual vehicles that will be flying across the globe. I know COVID has impacted this, but nevertheless, there would be a bump. I don't expect it to be flatlined over over the coming few years. And already there was a massive shortage of of career people that was was predicted over time. Um, I'm saying this because uh, it could now be disproportionately the way that people can access mm -hmm. across the globe. People here in the north where they can access these facilities and they know where a flight school is as opposed to somebody sitting in Africa, which was the case for myself when I was interested to do these things and I didn't know which door I need to knock into to, to make that a reality. Um, obviously, STEM has a lot of potential, uh, specifically on flight simulation, um, in terms of um, having different programs that can be either school-based, and this is the entire training continuum. I'm talking from initiating interest to kids and making them focus on such things uh, from, from practical standpoint to more of the uh, more professional people supporting them as part of the continuous professional uh, development. So it could be, and there are programs um, across the world and in particular mostly in the US where they have school-based um, curriculums that are using STEM and specifically flight simulation because the opportunities to use this specific uh, piece of tool is quite enormous um, in terms of different possibilities of learning that can be can be provided. And these are school-based way to be like within a structured learning, so teacher training programs and students with the lab in, in situ. Uh, in some other modalities, they have center-based uh, training programs where kids can interact with the center based and now with the information superhighway, um, remote learning, as well as uh, the use of virtual learning from home. When I do my simulation here, I'm able to, to do a multiplayer and uh, be able to fly together with multiple other people across the world. And, um, and these systems are also used for proficiency. Um, some of the certification that are required for professionals in, in these fields requires maybe for them to be current to make sure they can do procedures and such things and that is a, a definitely a huge potential for the certified end of the of the spectrum but uh, on the on the beginning end obviously that would be a good a good introduction to to to, to skills training and um, as you all know um there is a huge huge um potential for, 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 for such technologies also to be rolled out. And, and that in the North, they are already being rolled out within, say, defense um, systems and uh, the use and escalation of uh, uh, UAVs now, as we can see here. There is no reason why a simple system that is maybe PC-based uh, cannot be replicated in a low resource setup such as Africa, where kids can be introduced to, to very practical skills like touching a joystick, precision, uh, point flying, and navigating from point A to B. And, uh, and, and these are really practical uh, pieces that can be useful. It's not necessarily that they have to come to have careers in, in aviation, but it's definitely an, an eye opener and, uh, and the immersion that uh, most kids do do enjoy. There are a couple of programs, and, I, and uh, because this talk is fairly brief, there are a couple of programs uh, across Europe. I haven't seen many in this country. Most uh, simulation in this country are more from a commercial standpoint, not necessarily just broader learning piece. This is an area that uh, I personally was uh, looking into exploring further, um, undergoing my own personal reinvention <laughs> right now um, and uh, that is the reason why although my background is slightly diverse 
have been pulled into into these discussions and uh, it has been quite uh, uh, enriching for myself as well to hear some of the of the contribution from the other members in this panel yeah thank you Mushauri, for that uh, it's quite a, 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 a different perspective of course but it's it also presents an opportunity for people to learn and create a new new opportunity and skills so if i go to Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but I hope those those one who wish to maybe to depart. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, yes, okay. we can. <laughs> I thought we went off. So uh, we are running out of time, but if, if anybody wants to, we wish to depart, probably, we, if you don't mind, for a few minutes, we can hear from Denise in terms of how we can. Um, help people support in, in terms of building skills and and also probably take one or two questions before we wrap up denise if you probably you can you could hear from all the speakers talent development and acquisition and has been a, is, is one of the key issue and the developing the skill gap will be the way moving forward what's your thought from a recruitment perspective and how can we attract more bme into the sector Okay. Um, thank you. Obviously, thank you for inviting me to 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 um, share my views and share my perspective with you all. Um, my name is Denise Myers. I am a uh, co-founder of Even Fields Careers, which is a job board that focuses on diversity, and also Murray Myers Recruitment, which is a 360 recruitment agency that focuses on recruiting engineers into SMEs. Um, so that's my background. I've got 20 years experience in recruitment. Um, I, I would say what um, employers need to be um, doing now to uh, attract BAME talent into engineering is right, going right down to schools, uh, speaking to young people, making it interesting that's what we are doing we work with schools we work with a careers and enterprise company and we go into schools and we talk about um engineering and we talk about the the good things that can happen and um you know the things that they do at the moment you know they're they're on fortnight they're building um villages and they're building houses and they're building things on their you know on their playstations um, it, it's, it's trying to tie in uh, what their interests are uh, with what engineering and and also construction can offer. Um, and there's a wide range of obviously um, different sort of jobs that they can do um, and their careers can be uh, very varied in these industries. So I think that's the main thing that employers need to do. Um, what people need to do who are looking for jobs is again to realize that these sectors are very wide, they're very broad, um, and there are lots of different opportunities that would play on their skills. Um, and we need to look at those skills, um, AI, um, developing developers, these, these are the kinds of skills that, that, that are going to be needed in the engineering. Um, COVID has forced people to become more um, efficient in what they're doing. Um, so, so people are, are, are fast forwarding what they're, you know, they're, the, the use of robots and the use of AI, the use of chatbots um, with regards to the sales process and things like that as well. So there's a lot of um, new skills um, which you know Jonathan spoke about earlier that are that is definitely definitely needed and that we need to um, you know start to really think about and how we can get these skills and how we can upskill um, BAME candidates in, in this way as well so a lot of partnership a lot of collaboration I think will be needed with the recruitment uh, process and the education academia as well I think that is very much required and needed uh, and I don't think we, we don't do enough of it um, we are working with um, Birmingham University at the moment we're doing some projects uh, we're working on some projects with them as well as working with schools and some of the colleges as well 
um, because we need to be a, and, and linking employers into this as well. Um, that's the key that we all work together um, because we've all got different skills, skill sets that we can we can bring to this process. Um, I did have a lot more to say, but I will keep it short and sweet um, because I know people have got a, a week, a bank holiday weekend to to be getting. I know we're not going anywhere, but um, hey ho. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, thank you for that short brief and uh, probably no problem yeah uh, uh, if i go to dennis i know dennis has been um, uh, following up the discussion and picking up some questions dennis before we can go to wrap up and see if there's any additional comment from the speaker what 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 are your thoughts uh, any burning question that has not been uh, answered that need to be addressed or not really, just to say that the discussion has been so thought provoking. We've gone uh, one and a half hours into it when we had planned a shorter period of time. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting listening to the, the breadth of STEM, as you can imagine, you know, from, from blockchain to uh, every. But one of the things I picked up on was the challenge that is going to be happening post COVID in terms of educating the next uh, group of STEM specialists. Uh, especially for when you're talking about people from the BEM community who will have challenges getting online, whether it is through the equipment or data, access to data. And when you extrapolate that to Africa, it becomes much more complex. Uh, but I don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time to go into back and forth. There were very interesting questions that I was picking up on, but I know given the passion in the, on the group that uh, if, if I ask to share the questions, we'll be here all night. So I'll hand it back to you, Eugene. Eugene, you're muted, just, just so you know. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dennis, for the, 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 that brief summary. I don't know if in the interest of time, if there's any speaker that want to touch on anything, any, any of the comment, and then just as we wrap up, any comment, any observation from some of the key things that has been raised that you would like to respond to. I'm sure that the spectrum is quite broad from engineering to energy to uh, Finch Tech to, I don't know if any speaker has any comment as we wrap up. Hello? Hello. Uh, <laughs> it, it looks like probably no, no, no comment in terms of just to closing. Uh, well, I have a I have a comment. So I I, I think uh, 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 post COVID uh, should be an opportunity for um, universities in uh, sub-Saharan Africa to rethink how they uh, provide uh, no, how to educate you know, uh, uh, students because basically we have quite a lot of you know, uh, international students that are based in Africa and are doing courses online here in the UK, uh, even in the US, basically. But now with COVID, majority of students in most African countries, they are home, especially those from, you know, or those schooling in the uh, private universities, they are following tuitions online. What about those that are in government, you know, or maintained you know, universities? So this is a massive opportunity for them to be able to look at a way of turning things around, maybe a means of supplementing, you know, the, 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 their, their income basically. That is, if they have students, maybe post COVID, if they have students you know, on site and they may also want to have some students that are you know, studying online as well. So everything still goes down to technology. And as Michelle has said, you know, there are quite a lot of you no know, developers, you know, in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, you know, Kenya, Uganda, Ghana. So most of all these you know, developers, they are working for you know, the tech giants. So which means you know, I can be in Lagos in Nigeria and be working for you know, a tech company you know, uh, in California, or I can, be in, you know, I can be in Accra and be working for a biotech you know, uh, 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 company you know, in Sweden. So it is you know, uh, more or less like a, something that you open their eyes to you know, what needs to be done, especially given the experience that we've all had now. Yeah. And I think that is going to help in terms of you no, know, uh, uh, you know, uh, the value of the currencies because the more they are able to to let those you no know, money, you no know, those huge amount of money stay back, you no, know, the more they are going to be able to build the value of those currencies 
and the more the economy will grow basically mm -hmm. because if they have more of the money inside you know they'll be able to you know do some things and you know, the value will increase as well basically mm -hmm. Thank you, Rotunde. I know, of course, the digital and the remote economy will, will create ways in a way people can, some of those uh, opportunities can be unlocked and uh, some of the other things that have been uh, shared over the discussion. Uh, I don't want to take you your, more of your time. I've already taken 10 minutes extra of the time. So unfortunately, we've run out of time, but it has, it has been amazing, quite a lot insightful discussion and the lots of thought-provoking comments and quite a lot of key takeaways in terms of moving forward okay. of course COVID is like has has is reshaping the way the industry is going to be and coupled with technology and other things and but we need to look at the brighter picture as many right. is about adapting and accepting and moving forward and the, technology and the STEM, of course, will be at the heart of the majority of the things we've been doing moving forward. Thank you so much for our speakers, for our, your time and for joining us, sharing your expertise and experience and your perspective in terms of how your industries are moving and the, some of the key challenges and the opportunities are where they are likely to come from. We'll continue having this debate on a weekly basis and hopefully we'll get, we'll get more opportunity to bring you, to invite you back to share more of your thoughts and also hopefully we can deep dive into some of the key things that are being raised as is in some of these discussions. So I don't want to take most of any more of your time and I know the weekend is at, at the door, although we are in a lockdown. Thank you so much everyone, all the speakers and the people who join us to listen to some of the things our speaker has to share, share. And we wish you all the best and look after yourself and have a blessed weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Gene. That was great. Bye.